So this is another point. When you engage in a communication, try to understand the reason of the visit of your patient to you. A third barrier is the environment. Where you do your, com uh, your communication? If you do your communication in a very crowded place, do you think that the other party is listening to you and understand every single word you say? So one of the common problems in healthcare that sometimes we provide information to our patient in a very crowded place, like in pharmacy, like in nursing, like in accident emergency. So it's highly important when we are in this situation to make sure that we are delivering the message fully. And we would like to ensure that the other party understand and go fully. So spend more time spend more effort in providing a full details to your patient where there is crowdedness, all right? Highly important, it's not everything you say is received. Make sure of that. Another barrier for a proper communication is the body language. Sometimes your body language might be very offensive to the other party. And at that time, you will actually a high, big wall barrier between you and your patient. So it's highly important when you talk to your patient, take the proper body language. So what, what do you mean by the body language? Every body language, every position will denote on something. Some of them denotes arrogance. Some of them denotes defensive. Some of them denote anger. Some of them denote compassion. It's fine. So you have to identify what kind of body language you need to use while you are treating, you are communicating with your Now, how we talk, like how we create a message and how we send message to the other party. In fact, to start the process of talking, we need a sender, which is you when you start to talk. We need a sender, and that sender is going to create a message. So when you start to talk, we need a sender, and the sender is going to send a message. But when we send our message, actually, we encode the message. Remember this word, we encode the message. So we have the source, the sender, who create a message, and then we encode that message. I'm going to show you everything is about everywhere. We encode the message. And then we have to send it through the proper channel. The other party will receive it. And once the other party is going to receive the message, he she is going to decode the message and give a feedback. Let's take it one by one. You, as a sender, when you, as a doctor, as a healthcare professional, as a nurse, as a lab, as whatsoever, when you are whatsoever healthcare professional, you, as a source, whenever you have a message, you have to ask yourself three questions. What I want to communicate? I want to communicate health education. I want to communicate instruction about procedure. I want to communicate a message about the product I'm selling. I want to communicate um, the, the, the dose of the medication. What I want to communicate. And then you have to ask yourself why I want to communicate. For a reason, right? And then for, for the for the parents to understand the dose of the medication for my patient. Uh, for the patient to understand how he can prepare before a procedure. Uh, for a patient, how he can give me a proper feedback for the lens I'm making. So you have to put in your mind why you want to communicate. And then, what is the expected result? What do you expect as a result? All right? So whenever you'd like to communicate, put these three questions. What I would like to communicate why I would like to communicate, what are the expected acceptable results for me? Ready? Now you have the message. Okay, let's talk about the message. Make it simple. Make it easy to understood. Make it short. Einstein one day said, if you cannot explain it simply, you don't understand enough. Wait, sometimes when you come into 
confrontation uh, situation. You become like, have a lot of ideas in your mind, and you'd like to tell all of your ideas at the same time, so you become confused, right? You become confused, and you cannot express your feelings at that time, meaning at that time, you are not ready for the confrontation. Wait. Now, you as a source, as a sender, you create your own message, you would like to send it. Before you send it, you encode it. This is highly, this is the art. Coding is the art. Imagine we have something hot here. And we would like to tell the people that this is hot. So, dear, take care. This is a hot glass. If you touch, you're going to be hurt. All right, easy, right? But whenever you have a kid, do not say it like this. What you are going to do, you're going to go down, come close to the glass, the hot glass, say, Kid, dear, baby, darling, the hot glass. Don't touch it. Touch it, gonna be hurt. You're gonna take a, a different tone of your voice. You're gonna take a different position, right? You're gonna explain in a very simple way to encoding the message. Sometimes when you have, for example, an educated patient, so you start to tell like this. Here you have the your problem is upper respiratory tract infection. You need to take a medication. I'm going to prescribe for you an antibiotic. I'm going to prescribe the antibiotic three times a day, four, seven days. If you didn't get well, please come back after four days. Simple, right? But for other patients, you're going to do like this. Here, I'm going to prescribe for you medicine. Okay, this is antibiotic. You have to take it like three times per day. Three times, per, and you, you repeat, three times per day, for seven days. Okay, dear? Three, you, three times a day, for seven days. If you didn't feel good, please come. See, what are you doing? Plenty of body language, right? Plenty of body language. You have to come back to me after four. You start to do plenty of encoding, just for the other party to understand it spontaneously, but actually what you are doing, you encode your message. All right? So, we have a sender, create a message, encode the message, then you send it through a proper channel. This is another challenge in the proper communication, that the channel, the channel, the channel. What do I mean the channel? How do you send your message? Assumingly, assumingly, We having instruction for laboratory process. So is it okay for the head of the laboratory to take the phone and say, okay, dear, to do this laboratory um, uh, investigation, do it. number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. Can I do it over the phone? Can I tell the steps over the phone? If this is the proper message? Sorry, is this the proper channel? No, this should be written. So the proper channel should be a written manual. Assumingly, we are in the accident emergency and I have a collapsed person on the ground. Should I go for my email and say, dear or colleagues, now I have a collapsed person on the floor. Please come urgently. Thank you. Sincerely, Abdullah. Is it possible? Is this a proper channel? So why, when it comes to an urgent case, we send a text message? What we need in case of emergency? one-to-one -one communication or directly use the phone right or the alarm so whenever we have a message for example we have a full detailed message so it should be a written document like policy process guideline procedure manual right when we have an announcement or a circular it should be written and sent through the email for everyone when it's an emergency we have to immediately attend and have a one-to-one -one conversation or directly we call, right? So it's highly important to choose the proper channel to send your message. Once you send the message, you have to take the feedback. Make sure that the receiver, the recipient of the message is going to give you a feedback. The feedback will tell you, did the receiver understand the message? So how you, as the receiver of the message, you got the full message? by having what we call interactive learning, sorry, interactive listening. What do I mean by the interactive listening? 
you start to ask questions. You start to repeat or rephrase what I have said. It's highly important. It's highly important. It's highly important that you start to engage in the conversation by asking questions to get the full message. So the receiver or the recipient of the message have to show you any kind of understanding by repeating exactly what you have said, by rephrasing what you have said, by telling steps of what you have told. All right? OK? Till now, we OK? Now, let's take the proper communication and go into directly into the health. In healthcare, actually, we implement communication in different steps and different management. And the main idea of the communication in healthcare is to improve effective, coordinated communication among two parties, service provider and service provider, or service provider and recipient of care. So one of the communication happens between the healthcare team. Other communication happens between the healthcare provider and patient or patient and family, right? Do you agree? Do you agree? All right. So the first communication happened in, in something highly important. We call it two client identification. The client identification. This is where you start to talk to your patient. It's highly, highly important that we do two client identification using the full name and unique ID number. Using full name and unique ID number. So the unique ID number that we have in Bahrain is the CPR number. What about if we have a visitor? Use a passport number. Or you can create your own file number. Or you can use the insurance number. Don't depend on mobile number. All right? So it's highly important that first we need to identify the patient correctly. We need to identify the patient correctly. How? By depending on two patient identification. One, full name. Second is yeah, unique ID number. So is it possible to identify a patient by the patient bed number? Assumingly, we have like, um, assumingly, we have uh, Mr. Joseph Phillips. He is somewhere uh, our patient today. And he is in bed number five. And we are going to give John Phillips today um, insulin. He's not comfortable with bed number five. So he's going to move from five to six. And at the same time, someone else, Mr. Kumar, is coming and the only available bed is bed number five. What the nurse is going to do? The order comes to the patient in bed number. So we're going to give the wrong preventable medical error. The same applies to the bedroom. So we never depend on the bed number or the room number. We depend on full name and, OK, as a surveyor, we would like to make sure that every healthcare facility is implementing two patient identification. Two patient identification is one of the international patient safety goal requested by NHRA. International Patient Safety Goal for GCI, and it's one of the ROP of Accreditation Canada. As a surveyor, I would like to make sure staff are implementing two patient identification. How? So we come close to the pharmacy. We come close to the pharmacy and wait. Wait to see that the pharmacist is asking the patient, please show me your ID before they dispense medication. We come close to the nursing station. And we wait, wait to see that the nurse is asking the patient, please show me your CPR, or can you tell me your name? Can you tell me your CPR number? We would like to see that the radiology staff are asking the patient, please tell me your name, please tell me your CPR number, or they see the CPR. It's highly important that we see this in practice. If we didn't see this one in practice, 
meaning this organization is not implementing the first and important patient safety standard, which is two patient identification, two patient identification. All right? Okay? It's very, very common that we treat people with different names. It happens. Sometimes people with different names are in a hurry. So they saw that if they go directly to the doctor room, they will get the surface. But actually, they got the wrong surface. Remember this one, all right? There was one incident. There was one incident in a big secondary and tertiary care facility where an expat worker fall down in an occupational health trauma, and that expat worker has been transferred to the secondary care hospital. In the secondary care hospital, they registered the patient, they started the management, but unfortunately, the patient died. Unfortunately, the patient died. So they start to do the process. So they release the birth, the death certificate, and they start the, the, the process of transporting the body to the home country. What they have found in the immigration office, that that body is not belonging to that death certificate. Meaning, at the day of registering the patient in the hospital, his colleague registered the patient by his own CPR. So now we have a medical legal case where dead person is alive and the live person is dead. All right? Okay? We have plenty of cases where sometimes people come for sick leave. So they send some of the like sick relative instead of them to get the sick leave. And this is again a medical legal issue. All right? Please, we have plenty of people named after their grandpa or grandma name. So when we start to manage, we, de we didn't depend on two patient identification, we depend only on the name. We might prescribe the prescription belonging to the grandpa or to the grandma of the same family. Remember, it happens frequently. Yes. All right? So, what is the most important thing in communication? Number one, two client identifier or identify patient correctly. Please remember this, okay? One. Second, the second is safe surgery practice. Whenever we do a procedure, and actually every medical center and every hospital do um, a surgery procedure, right? In Derma, you do plenty of procedures. So we need to have what we call it Safe surgery practice. The main idea of the safe surgery practice is to make the right surgery or the right procedure for the right patient in the right side. Again, the main idea of safe surgery practice is to do the, the right surgery or the right procedure for the right patient in the right side. Two incidents, I know it. Two incidents, I know it. One day, there was a surgeon who's going to take two samples. One is a liver biopsy, second is a renal biopsy. Right? So, once he finished the first procedure, finished the second procedure, to so the second patient talked to the doctor and said, Doctor, you said that you are going to take the specimen from the front. Why you take it from the back? What happened? Switch it the piece. All right? Remember, very common. It's very, very common. Very common. So the main idea of safe surgery practice is to make sure we are going to do the right procedure, or the right surgery, the right patient in the right side. So usually we have the list of surgery. So in the operating theater, there is a list. Like in operating theater number one, for that patient, we are going to do that surgery by that surgeon. It's easy. Everything is written. But we would like to make sure that that coming patient is the right patient for the operating room number one. Do that surgery by that doctor. So at that time, the patient is coming fully conscious to the operating, to the operating theater, all right? So we start a process, what we call it, sign-in. 
By the way, what is the first thing you do when you firstly go into work? You sign in, right? You sign in. And what is the last thing you do when you finish your work? You sign out. Remember this. The first thing you do when you go into your work, you do what? You sign in. The last thing you do, you sign out. All right. This is exactly what's, ha what's happening with the patient. Once the patient is coming from the world to the operating theater, the patient is fully conscious. So the patient is signing in. So what is in the signing in? We start to ask the patient, can you tell us your name? We know actually the name. We have a list. Can you tell us your name? This is my name. Right. Can you tell us your ID number? This is my ID number. Right. Can you tell us what's your problem? I have this problem. Right. Can you tell me what kind of operation I do? I have this operation. Right. Do you have any allergy? Do you have any complication? We make sure that that walking patient is actually the blind patient for the operating room number one to do this surgery by that surgeon. All right? We finish with sign in. Now, we have the patient on the operating table. Before we start the procedure, we have a process of what? What is this? Timeout. This is where the principal surgeon is going to make sure that he said and announced, now I'm going to do the procedure XYZ for the patient name XYZ for the CPR number, that number. Everything is available? Yes. All device equipment instrument available? Yes. All the stuff are available? Yes. Can I start? Yes, start. Starting. Right? So the first step we call it, what's the first step? Sign in. What's the next step? Time out. Once we finish the operation, before we take the patient to the recovery room, the patient is signing, signing out. This way, we make sure the patient is in a good condition, vitally stable, no retained foreign body within the patient. The nurse is counting all the instruments and towel. Anesthetist make sure the patient is in good condition. Surgeon, principal surgeon, patient is in good condition. Now we take the patient back to the recovery room. So all of these are a kind of communication. We communicate with the patient in the sign in. We communicate as provider to providers in the sign uh, in the time out. We communicate with the patient and with the staff in sign out. All right. So the second part in effective communication healthcare is safe surgery practice. Safe surgery practice. The British people added two more steps. By the way, the safe surgery practice is created by the WHO. The British people added two more steps. One is briefing. So they make a briefing before they sign in. What do I mean by briefing? Like the surgery team come together all together in, the, um, in a meeting room and say, today we are going to do this kind of surgery. And we expect to finish in, for example, in one hour, in two hours. We expect this kind of complication. We are preparing patient for one and two and three. And then we start to ask about some questions. Did we give the patient like pre-operative um, antibiotics? Did we prepare this kind of devices, of sets, of blood units, and so on and so forth? So this is the briefing about the operation. And once we finish the briefing, we go into the sign in, and then the time out, and then the sign out. Then once they finish, they do what we call the debriefing. They start to discuss the case. Like, we, we assume that the diagnosis was X, Y, Z, but actually found differently. We say that we are going to spend like one hour in the operation. It takes like three hours. So how can we improve our performance in the future? So they start to have an, uh, like a, a, a productive discussion how they can improve such procedure in the future. All right? And how they can avoid any potential complication in the future. I'm going to show you and share with you a video about the safe surgery practice. Uh, 
Okay, now we learn two things in the communication, right? Remember, communication happens between service provider and service provider, service provider and recipient of care. Finish with two patient identifier, finish with safe surgery practice. And this is the checklist created by WHO. Every, every procedure room needs to have that checklist. Every operating room 
need to have that list implemented. Implemented. When the surveyor will come, they would like to see that there is already written text, text, checklist for every single patient attended to do procedure or attend to do surgery. Okay? We as a surveyor would like to see for every single registered person or patient for surgery or a procedure. You already do that. Safe surgery practice. You take the safe surgery checklist. All right? Okay. We finish with two and fire safe surgery practice. Let's go for it. Yesterday we talked about, yesterday, if you remember, yesterday we talked about do not do list. Yesterday we talked about dangerous abbreviation, right? So let's share it again today. Let's share it again. Dangerous abbreviation. Let's talk about the zero. So dangerous abbreviation. Dangerous. Abbreviation. Let's talk about the zero, all right? Okay. As we said yesterday, if we're going to write a medication, for example, insulin, five decimal, zero, unit subcutaneous. So we said that after any decimal, there is no need for the, because we call this one trailer, zero. So it is not advisable, it's not allowed to put zero after the decimal because it might be mistaken as a full number as 50. However, we need to put the zero before the decimal. So for example, if we give a medication like um, L-tyroxine, we give this one in a fraction. So it's 0.25 mg, right? Tablet. If we didn't put the zero, if we didn't put the zero, it's going to be mistaken as 25, and this 100 times the normal. So, for the zero, no zero after decimal, but 100% zero before decimal. This is number one. And then, when we talk about the unit and international unit, we said, for example, this is insulin, five, subcutaneous, right? So it is not advisable to write U because it might be mistaken as 4. So unit might be mistaken as 4 or 0. So it's not allowed to write as unit, U. But how we have to write it as full word unit. So it should be insulin, 5, unit, and then subcutaneous. All right? All right. When we talk about the end, we still with insulin or anyone, um, 5, IU. Again, it is not advisable to write IU because it's mistaken for 14 or 10. It is advisable to write as international unit. Okay? The same apply for the IU, international unit, is applied for the intravenous. We need to write it intra. Now, let's come for the abbreviation of medication. It's not advisable. To write any abbreviation of medication because we don't deal with magician. Nurses and pharmacists are not magician. They are human beings. Human error is very potential. So we need to write the full name. So please try to avoid the BCT, the HC, any abbreviation, especially when we have the same abbreviation here, like MS. MS could be morphine sulfate or could be magnesium uh, sulfate. Yes, morphine sulfate or magnesium sulfate. Please try to avoid the abbreviation. Write the full name, like paracetamol rather than PC, hydrocortisol rather than H. Other people are using this even in dangerous medication like the chemotherapy. Please avoid this one. All right? So this is what we call it the dangerous abbreviation. No U, no 
internet i u no o d b d q d just write once a day twice a day three times a day no trailing zero no abbreviation this is the third one in communication the fourth one in communication something we call it medication reconciliation medication reconciliation this is a process between service provider and patient Sometimes, not sometimes, always, we have patient coming with bag of medicine, right? Especially for kids or for elder, uh, for elder group. Kids and elder group, usually they attend with bag of medicine. Why? Because they have a frequent visits for healthcare providers. So what we need to do, basically, when we have a patient, number one, we need to identify the current list of medication. We need to identify the current list of medication. We start to do the medication reconcil um, uh, reconciliation. So you ask your patient, can you tell me the list of the current medication? Once you know it and you start to manage the patient, you either keep the same list or you modify the current list, you add, you remove, you do whatever. But if we didn't do medication reconciliation, we might give the same, we repeat the same medication. Is it possible? Possible. So if we repeat the same medication, what will happen to the patient? We might give an overdose, or even we might reach to a toxic dose. I'm gonna give you some examples. Uh, for cardiac patient, for example, for cardiac patient. Cardiac patient receive a kind of calcium channel blocker, from one major entity as, you know, the calcium, block, um, calcium, calcium channel blocker agent, okay? It is available as um, Nurvask, right? Nurvask, and it's available as five or 10. This is available in one healthcare facility, a major healthcare facility, public healthcare facility, right? So if in this sector, they are giving the nervous. But because that patient is a cardiac patient, usually that cardiac patient have another visit in another cardiac center, another healthcare facility, public healthcare facility, where sometimes they have the calcium channel broker as a stent. Again, it's five and 10. Both of them are the same product. But if the doctor here or there didn't ask the patient, about the medication reconciliation, what will happen to the patient? It might duplicate the calcium channel blocker. So the safety one is 10. That patient might take 15 or might take 20. What will happen? Calcium channel blocker. That patient might have a major negative impact on the heart and die, right? Okay. In some facilities, we have blink. In Bahrain, we have diabetes in a high, high incidence of diabetes. So in the public sector, they give the major one, which is um, uh, glucophage, okay, metformin. The metformin. The metformin, all right? So maybe the patient is treated in the public sector, but at the same time, that patient receives a more consultation in the private sector. Without doing, without doing the medication reconciliation, what will happen? That patient might take metformin in the public sector and then go for the private sector and receive something like glucovan, which is actually metformin plus another medication. So what will happen? More and more of one of the medications that have an impact on, on the liver and kidney. So this is highly important. The same will apply for our kids. Maybe we have our kids visiting plenty of the pediatrician. With the first pediatrician, the kid received antibiotic, antihistaminic, and cough syrup. With the second visit to another pediatrician, they might give the, the, the same child again antibiotic, cough syrup, and another sedative, but with different names. What will happen? We are overloading our patient with plenty of medication that might exceed the, the safety level. This will add a major negative impact on our patients. So what we need to do? We need to do what? Medication 
reconciliation. It's highly important to do what? Medication reconciliation. So before we start to treat the patient, can you tell me your current list of medication? I don't know. Please try to get me the list. Call your uh, relative at home, take a photo and show it to me now, go back home and bring it to me. You have to tell, you have to make sure that you have the current list, all right? Medication reconciliation. Not only that, not only you know that what are the names of the current medication, you have to ask your patient how frequently they are taking actually the medication. I'm going to give you an example. Assumingly, we have a patient with hypertension, right? So we're going to prescribe for that patient a medication. Based on the guideline, we might give that patient a medication, X, Y, Z, with, uh, with a dose of 5 mg. All right? The patient will come after two weeks as per your instruction or advice for a follow-up. Doctor, I still have the sick, still have the headache and tiredness. You repeat measuring of the blood pressure and you find this, what you are going to do. You might increase the dose from 5 to 10, right? So you increase the dose from 5 to 10. In the next visit, in the follow-up, doctor, I still have the same problem. Measure the blood pressure, still have. What you are going to do, you're going to add another medication. So now you, with the first one, you reach to the highest level, and then you start to add the second medication. Then again, you're going to follow up. The patient is not responding. You are going to increase the second medication. So now you have two medications reach to the, the maximum level. But if you do a proper medication reconciliation, you have to ask your patient this question. Dear, can you tell me how you take your medication? Take your medication every day. Actually, doctor, uh, it makes me feel like coughing. And sometimes it makes me have like, um, you know, like this sensation in the stomach. So at that time, you know that your patient is not complying with the medication. So rather than increasing from 5 to 10, what you need to do is to ensure compliance of your patient with the given medication. If the patient is complying with the given medication, there is no need to increase. So what you have done is actually a wrongdoing. You need to ensure in your also in the medication reconciliation that your patient is complying with the given medication as per the instruction. All right? The third point in healthcare communication is Medication reconciliation, two patient identification, safe surgery practice, dangerous abbreviation, fourth one, sorry, the fourth one, medication reconciliation. All right? Till now is okay? Now, the fifth one is to improve, to improve and fill the gap in transferring communication between two parties. When we transfer our patient from one department to the other department, we need to fully give full information about that patient. Yesterday, we talked about the I pass. Today, we're going to talk about I spar. Today, we're going to talk about I spar model. So what's I spar model? I spar model is the framework of Verbal and over the phone communication in healthcare. Again, ISPAR is a framework of communication in his consultation room and see if such call. Hello, doctor. Hello, doctor. Please come. I have an emergency case. And then we hang on the phone, right? So rather than doing this, if we implement the ISPAR, we are going to give the full details of the situation. So I. I refer to identify yourself, identify your place, identify to whom you are talking, identify the name of your patient. I identify yourself, identify your place, identify to whom you are talking, identify the name of the patient. Assumingly, assumingly I am the dentist working with the patient in the dental clinic number three. While I'm working with the patient, the patient collapsed. Vasovagal attack and patient collapsed. What I need to do, I need to urgently 
call a medical doctor to come and help, right? So is it okay, like, hello doctor, hello doctor, please help me, please come. I don't know to whom I'm talking. I don't know the other doctor, don't know what actually is the case. Where should I go? What's the name of the patient? The same. So, hello doctor, this is, for example, the dentist XYZ. I'm talking from dental room number X. I'm talking to Dr. Abdullah, yes. This doctor, I have a, a, a patient with vasovagal attack. Please help me immediately. Thank you. All right? So number one, identify yourself. Number two, tell us about the situation. Situation meaning, I have a patient name. Age, complaining of. So for example, if I'm in the accident emergency and I'm calling the doctor, hello doctor. This is Abdullah, the nurse calling from the nursing station. So I'm talking to Dr. Dua. Yes, I'm, this is Dr. Dua. All right. Doctor, I have a patient named Hussain Ali Hussain. He's 60 years old. He come with severe chest pain. He has sweating and vomiting, and the pain is 9 out of 10. This is the situation. A patient, 60 years Chest pain, severity of the pain, vital signs, and the complaint itself. This is the situation. Now, give me background. Doctor, the patient claimed that he has done a cardiac operation before. He has plenty of visits to the cardiac center. Okay. He is diabetic, hypertensive, dyslipidemia. All right. So this is the, this is the background. Now, I need the assessment of the person attending the patient. Doctor, I think this is an acute MI. And finally, what is the request? What is the recommendation? Please come now. So as a doctor, I have to leave everything and jump from my chair to the nursing room, right? A framework where you give the full detail. In SPAR, we use SPAR actually uh, between it's an easy framework for junior to transmit the full information to the senior. So they are breaking the barrier of feeling afraid of communicating to the senior, right? It's a way of transferring the information during shift. Like once you finish your shift and you need to give your colleagues the information about the available patient now, you use the ISPAR model. All right? We finish with ISPAR. Any question till now? I'm going to share with you a model of ISPAR where we have a situation like in one day, a junior doctor called the senior in the middle of the night and he asked him to attend to the patient and he didn't give a full information about the case. So the surgeon was reluctant because there was no like an urgency in the calling. So when, once the surgeon attend, found the patient in very bad condition and he spent the whole day resuscitating and dealing with the emergency. Then with that scenario, we're gonna have the same consultant, but with a, another junior doctor. The other junior doctor is going to introduce for that consultant um, a chest case, a patient with a pneumonia. So she, as a junior, is going to talk to the consultant in as using the framework of ISPA, all right? We're going to talk about the what is the situation, what is the background, what is her assessment, and what is her recommended plan of management, and she's going to take the approval from him. So once she's going to talk, you're going to see this is the situation, the background, this is the assessment. But at the beginning of the video, you're going to see that how much he was annoyed from the former, from the other doctor, you wake him up early in the morning without giving a full information details about the other case.
Okay. Any question till now with communication? Question? Very much. Let's have a break for 10 minutes. 